Today I'm doing a study of the breed known as Navajo Chero Sheep. These are an endangered breed of sheep and we are going to have a wonderful interview in just a few moments with someone who raises these sheep as uh, part of her own flock and works with their wool and I have some of this amazing wool to work with today. So this is a breed study with a lot of history and information about Navajo Churro sheep. This is a picture of the actual sheep that the wool I will be uh, working with today came from. Isn't he handsome? <laughs> And I am really looking forward to the interview that I did with Arlene Vasquez, who is the owner of Wild Wool Farms, and uh, we will get to talk to her in just a moment. So here is the wool that Arlene sent to me from the Navajo Chero sheep that she raises. I have some raw in here, and it did come from a ram. So it has a little bit of a musky smell to it. If you are working with ram, my favorite way to get rid of that is to scour the, the smell, um, is to scour the wool just like I would. And then at the end, after it's been scoured, I put it in a vinegar rinse and then I let it dry in the sun. And usually that smell is conquered by vinegar. I then have some unprocessed locks. These are clean, but they are just, scoured and they were this and now they're this and then I have some roving and the roving is what I will be spinning today. So let's go ahead and uh, have a chat with Arlene so that as I get to show you how I'm spinning this wool you'll have a beautiful context and history for the importance and uh, the beauty of the breed Navajo Chero sheep. So I am thrilled to welcome Wild Wool Farms to the channel. So I would love for you to introduce yourselves and let us know what you're all about. Well, thank you for inviting us for, to this. Um, we appreciate it. This is my daughter-in-law, Jen. Hi. And I'm Arlene Vasquez, and we are Wild Wool Farm. Um, we raise rare and endangered breeds of sheep. Um, we specialize in the most unique ones we have found over the years. What got you interested in rare <laughs> breeds of sheep? What yeah. was the Her husband, my son, behind the camera running this for us. When he was about nine years old, he was in 4-H and he didn't want to do goats. One do sheep. Every time it was his turn to go in the show ring, I couldn't find him. He's standing over there watching him show sheep. And that's all he'd say through the whole time at the fair. Mom, I want sheep. Oh, I want to do sheep. I'm like, okay, okay. What kind of sheep do you want? Well, all of our 4-H people were goat people. They're like, we don't know nothing about sheep. So I went out and found him the sheep. It was at a sale barn. It was super old. I mean, she was super old. We call it her granny. She didn't have any teeth, nothing. We didn't know. So he had this lovely, fat, white, old sheep named Granny. And that's what he started with that first year. And he really, 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 really wanted a black sheep. I'm like, great. Now I get to find a black sheep. Okay. So I found these people that had Navajos and Black Welsh, and they wanted to sell everything as a bundle. I'm like, I just wanted one. Well, no, I brought home about 20 sheep. Wow. There you go. Here's some sheep. They <laughs> wow. were all registered purebreds, but I got his Black sheep. And the more that we worked with them, especially him, and learned about them, the more excited he was about it. They don't look like when people Google sheep or drive by them in a pasture, they're like, oh, look at all the big white sheep, or, you know, maybe you'll have a few colors. But the Navajos, they have the multiple horns, and they come in all different color patterns, which is really, really cool. And you can have a multiple color 
in one, like one of our rams, he looks kind of like a grayish color. But when I shear him, he's got spots like a Dalmatian. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you helped shear that guy once. So anyways, so I acquired all these sheep for Michael. The state fair here in Puyallup, what do they call it now? The Washington State Fair. The Washington State Fair for, um, we did it for about 28 years. They invited us. It, you can only come if you're invited. And they would invite us to bring the sheep in to put them in their animals of the world display. So all of us would go down as the family and we would um, put them up on display for people to see them. That's fantastic. And, um, I, I want to say real quick, I recently went to the Wisconsin Sheep and Wool Festival and they had a barn in a similar way. And it was just all the pens of different rare um, rare breeds of sheep. And it's really such a wonderful resource for educating people about how, like you said, the sheep that we kind of envision, it's sort of this one particular generic white fluffy sheep, but the, the variety of breeds and the importance of those genetics are just so like, you can't, you can't even hardly say how important well, you it know, is. Know, yeah. To have that variety. It's very. So many um, of the breeds have almost been lost, like the Navajo and the Black Welsh. The Black Welsh are black. You can't dye that fleece. It's going to be black. The Navajos, they're a double coated breed. They're not Merino soft. They're not BFL soft. And people are like, mm, I don't want to make a rug. But. You can, yes, you can this separate that coat and you can have two different, uh, a soft fiber and a coarse fiber. And depending on how much of those two you leave together, you can get that from coarse to soft mixture medium that you want. And I enjoy spinning it. Um, I lock spun it too, you know, pulled it apart, lock spun it, um, combed it on combs. Um, it's nice for people to also experience something that's coarser like that. I think I've shown mm -hmm. you on that, Jen, where you can take a real soft, like say Merino or something, and you blend that in together. And then you end up where it's not as, what would you say, obtrusive to some people. You know, they, they can get to experience it and enjoy it, but still wear it close to their skin, especially people that are sensitive. Right. Traditional Navajo textiles relied entirely on this sheep and there's just such beautiful tapestry style weavings that um, are traditional, but to use this wool, we don't have to like try and only do rugs from this wool. There's so many other types of textiles that, uh, that we can use this for. We can knit with it. We don't have to weave with it. And the thing about keeping breeds alive, if we don't use the wool, then there's no purpose for the sheep, right? So then right. people choose other breeds that they find to be more marketable. And then we start to lose that, again, that diversity. And so using the wool, that's the whole point of the Shave Them to Save Them project is to use the wool of these rare breeds so that there continues to be a market for these rare breeds. And while it's, you know, vitally essential to save these breeds, you know, particularly Navajo Chura for Navajo textiles, like that's, that's an area that like, I'm not venturing into that. That is a tradition. And there are people, you know, culturally who are teaching that I get a lot of people who um, have asked me about that. And it's like, I, I'm not the person to teach you that. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that I can't use and enjoy the wool and incorporate it into my own crafts. 
So I think that's an important distinction to kind of make for people to say, yeah, use this wool. That's important. Buy this wool. Let's keep this breed alive. Let's utilize it. I also want to add, because you brought up Shave Them to Save Them, we are members of Shave Them, Shave them to Save Them. So. so you can get a sticker. <laughs> yes, yes. On your passport. Yeah. Yes. I think it's really important and it's really cool that the Shave Them to Save Them um, does this to make more people aware that are not of these rare breeds. Um, because they can't compete with the big commercial wool producers. They can't, pr they can't compete with the big um, um, meat producers. Um, I, I know when you've been there at the fair mm -hmm. with us and people are like, well, they aren't going to have a lot of meat on them. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, you can eat them. And actually, truthfully, the meat is way better tasting than what you buy in the store. It's just different. It's better. But if when we would go into the show ring, they're like, we don't know where to put them. There's not, there wasn't classifications for those breeds, right? There was for Romneys and so on and so forth. So you have to compete against these other big breeds, Suffolk, Dorset, Hampshire, mm -hmm. and they're huge. First thing out of the judge's mouth is, well, you know, it's a lovely sheep, but it's too small. It's small. Yeah. It doesn't have the amount of meat, never will, that this one over here with is that's a pony size. You can't compete with that. So here they are um, with this tiny sheep just shaking up the, the competition because they didn't know what to do with it. I mean, we would take the breed standard with us, what the animals, put, and they would fit that breed standard to a T perfectly. They'd show beautifully, but you can't compete against that. If And most of the judges were meat judges. And then the wool judges would be like, well, yeah, it's like fitting everything, but it's got different colors in it. You're not going to get a consistent dye. So, yeah, no, you're not going to get a consistent dye. No, it's not super soft merino. It's not, you know, Romney. I like to go out with my coffee after I feed in the morning and just watch them. They all have their own personality. You know, I mean, I was showing Jen. I had her stand on my front porch and I said, close your eyes. Now, try and recognize the different ones' bath. Mm -hmm. Each one has a uniquely yeah. different bath. And she can pick one of the um, older gals out because every time she baths, she sounds like she's gargling. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> Jen's like, that's the one out there. <laughs> uh, we also have a, a Lincoln. And I don't know if you've ever heard of Lincoln. Yes. Yeah. And it's very, 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 very distinct. And the, we've, we have a lot of kids and the kids love him so much. They even named him. His name is Buddy. And they're like, where's Buddy? Can you hear him? <laughs> but with your primitive breeds, your brains haven't been bred out of them. When you breed animals to suit what a person wants, you breed a lot of faults into them. Um, I know quite a few big time Suffolk breeders. And so with breeding that breed bigger, longer, taller, um, they bred a lot of mothering instincts out of them. And I don't know how many times over the years they've commented to me about how, um, yeah, we had lambs and now we're having to take care of them because the mom's like, oh, you know. <laughs> that happened with Navajo Churro as well. Um that other breeds were brought in to try and improve their wool and and by improve and what we're talking about just so the viewers are aware when we talk about primitive sheep versus improved sheep basically improved means meant for industrialization so it has more um, uniformity in a uh, white wool so that it can be dyed it has uh, more standards so that 
you know, the yarn from one batch is going to look exactly like the yarn from the other batch so that you get the exact same cloth out of all of it so that you can sell it on an industrial textile kind of market. So when we talk about primitive breeds, these are like the double coated breeds and the ones that haven't been changed to industrialization standards, right? So that was done to Navajo Churro that they were attempted to be improved. And it actually, it, it wrecked the flocks of sheep because they couldn't survive anymore in the environment that they were best suited to. A Churro breed and an Iberian breed that is extinct. So those two were traded and acquired by the natives and they crossed these to create the Navajo Churro. And then when the natives didn't want to quit raiding, uh, they didn't want to get kicked off their land, the government came in and removed them. And also to punish them, decimated their herds, slaughtered them, took them. There was a lot of them left in the canyons and how do you say that? Arrows? Ar arrows? It's like a canyon in, in like Arizona, New Mexico area. So there was few pockets of them left. And um, so... Then the government was like, oh, no, we've done this bad thing. We're going to make ourselves look better. So here, here's some Merino sheep, much better wool, softer than that coarse crap you've got. Here. So they brought these, these rams in and whatnot from other breeds to improve, like you were saying. And that is one of the reasons that the Navajo Churro Association does not allow you to register your animal, even if the parents are registered. Every animal has to be inspected, either in person or by pictures and wool sample. They have to fit the breed criteria to... Um, be registered and they can't even have a registration until they're at least 18 months old because that gives them enough time to mature and change. Um, they're supposed to have a fairly clean belly, fairly clean face, clean leg, because that's what would all get caught up in the burrs out there in the Southwest. That makes sense. It's not really usable wool anyways. So, um, and that's something that can happen if you have a line of sheep where a different breed was introduced generations ago, you can get a lamb. I think it's, it's term is a throwback where mm -hmm. it has the, tra it has the traits of even, a, you know, great, great, great grandpa sheep <laughs> came in and changed things right. up a little bit. All of a sudden you have a lamb that's a throwback. And so you wouldn't want that. That's how you take out those characteristics. So that you can right. get back to the, the characteristics of what the, the true original My, um, Or our six horn Navajo that we have at home. Um, he has three, three sets of horns on each side and they come down. So unless wow. you're looking up close, you don't see the line in between. I've got two sons out of him that have the four horns. So very impressive guys. But hit one of his lambs that were born this year. You could feel it. Remember the little dude with the cute little voice? He, his wool, I could tell right away, was too soft. That's a throwback from the Merino introduced 100 years ago. Wow. No matter what, it stuck in those bloodlines. But as a responsible breeder and someone who wants to sell my wool, for somebody to enjoy that Navajo, a true Navajo, that's not desirable for me. But I don't want somebody getting him and going, I got a Navajo and I'm going to breed it. I can't allow someone else to be an irresponsible breeder. 
So I weathered him. So he's a fixed male. And he found a home. Um, this wonderful lady got him this year. Um, she's going to use him for petting when people come to the farm, which is perfect for a weather. That's all that's he perfect. wants. Pet me and eat. Yeah, <laughs> that's perfect. I'm so glad he has a happy life. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> With spinning and using these rare breeds, you get all that tactile, that different feel. Texture. Yeah. The texture. Thank you. That's what she's here That's for. I'm here for. Correct oh, me on it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can I completely agree. The the range of natural colors is like its own palette. And then when you combine that with the variety of textures, it's just an absolute, you know, like uh oh, a dream <laughs> to explore yeah. all, these different, uh, all the variety and it's just there it's just natural it's just how the sheep are growing the color and the texture for, for us to yeah it's fantastic I'm also tactile absolutely I love it <laughs> so it, and it helps a more lot. Spinners. <laughs> well that's why Jen was suggesting the the natural box of the Navajo fiber there you've got She's yeah. like, why shouldn't the people, you know, yeah, is um, this, is try this it in the raw, wash. That's the one that when I shear him off, see his face, how it's spotted? His yep. face is spotted. His whole body is spotted Dalmatian like that. Oh, wow. And then that's the wool that comes from him. It's beautiful. It's so like it, a gray. In a minute, I will be spinning this. You won't get to see because that's the beauty of editing. <laughs> <laughs> but for the people who are watching this video, in just a moment, they will get to see me um, spin that up in a couple ways. Uh, so I would like to just give you the opportunity, let people know where they can find you and um, how best to purchase from you. Hmm. You want me to take that? Yes. So Please. you can go to our website, wildwolffarm.com. We are also on um, all of the other platforms. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram. You can follow us on TikTok, Wild Wolf Farm LLC. We're trying to boost some, um, some viewers so we can go live on TikTok. We have to have a thousand followers. So you can follow oh. us there. We can get you there. I will have all of the links for all of the stuff in the description of this video. So friends, help them out so they can go live on TikTok and go follow them on, on TikTok. Yes, we'll get you there. <laughs> we also have a group on Facebook called Cozy Up by the Fire. We, it is a place for people to come, spinners, um, filters, weavers. Um, weavers. Uh, we have a people from all over that come and join and it's just a place for people to come and hang out with people that have the same likes and interests there you might be the only person in your town that that does this and it's a way for people to have a community we love when people showcase what they're working on and everything like that so it's just a it's just a fun group environment especially That's when you fun. have like a new spinner going Asking I just questions. found this yeah. and, you know, I, it doesn't look like what I, and so we can sit back yeah. and say, you're doing fine. Mm -hmm. You're doing fine. No, it's not going to be perfect your first mm -hmm. or second time, but you know what? You keep up the good work. Yeah. It's a way for us to also encourage mm -hmm. new people, people who've been doing it for mm -hmm. a while. Or if you haven't tried particular fibers mm -hmm. and we know about it, or maybe someone in our group does, right. mm -hmm. you know, how many people have, you know, stepped forward and commented. Yeah. yeah. And, and community is community. one of yeah. the things I love so much about the just fiber arts, the way that community comes together and how people help each other out and support the new spinners because we need spinners. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's been a things. wonderful experience. It's wonderful. It's so good. Well, thank you both again so much for your time and sharing your wisdom and knowledge and expertise and experience. This has been such a great chat. So thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you, Evie, very much. It's been a lot of fun. Arlene generously sent me a roving of some of the Navajo churro wool from her flock, and that is what I am spinning here. I already got started, and I have one and a half ounces on this bobbin, one and a half ounces to go. I'm going to make this a two ply, um, and I'm spinning it fairly thick. I felt like spinning thick made sense. Um, because this has an inner and outer coat, it has some of these little fuzzy bits. When there's an inner and outer coat blended together, trying to make it very thin, for me at least, is a little tricky. Because what tends to happen is the longer fibers tend to pull out, and then I have a handful of fluff left over in my hand. And then I get thin spots and slubs of the inner coat, the shorter, fluffier inner coat. And so spinning it thick is a way to keep everything, I just feel like it keeps it a little bit more consistent, a little more cohesive, and I think it makes a lovely bulky weight yarn. So that is what I'm doing. I do need to switch bobbins, so let's go ahead and do that real quick and um, take a look at the whirl that I have and the tension system I'm using. So I am using a scotch tension system and I'm using the largest whirl that I have for this ladybug. Here's my bobbin. It looks really lovely. It has kind of a blend of gray and brown and I just really like it. It's a it's a yarn with character, but I do like the character. <laughs> the bobbin that I'm putting on has a little leftover on it from a previous project, but I will just use that as my leader. So what I'm finding is working best for having a nice thick yarn from this wool is to do a long draw and then every now and then I do get a bit of a slub and I go back and kind of double draft that. So I do the initial long draw and then whoops, make the wheel go the right way. <laughs> So I do the initial kind of long draw, and then, well, I haven't had a slub here for a minute. There's kind of a slub right here, a little bit. So when I get a slub like that, I kind of unroll just a smidge and sort of yank on it so that it incorporates. It's usually that inner coat that kind of wants to stick out and so I get that incorporated so that it makes it a little more consistent. Like here's another one. So I just kinda get that down in there. So if I was doing a high twist yarn, I could put more twist in there and it would be very consistent and firm. It'd be great. <laughs> but I, I don't wanna do too high of a twist 
that was why I put it on the um, larger whorl. I'd like to I like I'd like to have a bulky yarn though, but just not a uh, um. Just not a super high twist bulky. So early on as the bobbin gets full, it's like you have to change the hooks all the time. <laughs> When I was a beginning spinner, I was in a very active online forum and it was very common for people to ask questions about spinning in this forum and then the answer that they commonly would get was, uh, just let the wool tell you what it wants to be. <laughs> and I rolled my eyes at that quite a lot because starting out I wanted to know all the technical things. I wanted the answers to do it this way and get this thing. And I really thought that uh, having people listen to the wool was an excuse <laughs> to throw wool at the wheel and take whatever yarn you got. And um, I wanted more control than that over what my yarn would become and I've become a much more technical spinner over the years and I do have that control over my yarn but I have also come around to see the value that I'm not just imposing my uh, design for the yarn onto the wool but that I'm working in a partnership with the wool and the wool does want to be a certain way, and if I respect that, I will get better yarn. <laughs> this yarn I struggled with a little bit because I don't have a lot of experience with this breed of wool, and I wasn't exactly sure how to spin it. But after a few days of just kind of having it out and having it where I could look at it, I could walk by it, I could pet it, I could feel it. Eventually, it just kind of settled in that, yeah, it's just going to be a bulky two-ply yarn. That's what the yarn wants to be. That's what the wool wants to be. And once I got that, this is really turning into a lovely yarn, and I'm really enjoying spinning this. I finished the spin and it's time to ply. I have my bobbin set up on my Tension Lazy Kate and I'm using one whirl faster on the wheel just because I want to have a little extra twist in this final ply. If you are interested in seeing and learning about the way that Danae used this particular breed of sheep for uh, spinning for traditional Navajo woven rugs, I have put together a playlist and you can go and check that out after this video uh, to learn more about those traditional spinning techniques. <laughs>